State v. George Allen Kelly has finally finished after approximately four weeks of trial. On Monday, April 22nd, Judge Thomas Fink declared the case a mistrial. Since my last video, there were many witnesses who testified, the jurors visited the ranch, and the jurors deliberated. In this video, I will cover some of Detective Ainsa's testimony as well as closing remarks. Hello, I'm Deborah Lally and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe and activate the notification bell to stay up to date on all upcoming videos. Let's get started. Detective Ainsa was the lead detective in the case. Defense attorney Kathy Lothorp uh, was the one who questioned him regarding his involvement in the case. In my opinion, she did a really good job um, getting the information out that she wanted to get out. Uh, there was a lot of mistakes in some of the reporting that was done, and there were things that he could have done to correct that, uh, but he didn't. There were some mistakes that were done that the defense was able to point out that he did not fix. For example, sometimes officers can write supplemental reports when they notice there are certain errors or where they have to uh, correct something. However, in this case, certain things were pointed out uh, that were never corrected. Defense attorney also early on asked uh, the detective whether he was focused on making Mr. Kelly uh, guilty of this crime. So you came into this investigation very focused on wanting to make this about Mr. Kelly being found guilty. Isn't it true? That is not true, ma'am. Well, let's take a look at this, how everything unfold, unfolded, okay? Yes, ma'am. And she goes on to talk about uh, portions in the report uh, that the detective completely... Uh, forgot about, as he claimed. Uh, the detective tries to explain that he didn't intentionally leave that uh, part out, and he tries to uh, explain uh, his mistake. Let's watch that portion. Yes, after Ms. Larkin presented this during our original PH, I did ownership, I did it, and I tell her, but I, I was not lying about it. I completely forgot about me assisting our sergeants filling out the letters during this portion of the booking form. Not only was I taking phone calls, typing up a search warrant and multiple things. <coughs> and I completely forgot that I did the narrative. There was no lie. I did not misinterpret this booking form at all. I took responsibility for not realizing that I did the narrative. It wasn't a lie. It was not done intentional. And I took responsibility for that to Ms. Larkin during her PH. Okay, so I think what you're saying is you're admitting that you misrepresented writing this, but later no, changed I, it. That's, I didn't say that. I said I did not misrepresent this booking form at all. I just completely forgot that I assist. Well, I requested assistance from the sergeants to to book them in while I did everything else. I was doing, I was doing finish up the interviews. I was preparing evidence uh, to go out to the scene. I was believe finishing up preparing the search for an on the phone with a judge to get the search warrant granted. I did not lie or intentionally say that I didn't do this. Okay. I owned up to it. And I told Ms. Larkin that I owned up to it. I did not lie about it. Well, let's just, even though that was under sworn testimony in a hearing. Yes, I understand that. Okay. And you were under oath. And then ultimately you realized you did. Yes, ma'am. And now you're saying... You're admitting that you wrote this part. The, the narrative part, ma'am. Yes. yes. Okay. She goes on uh, to point out a lot more inconsistencies. Okay. Now, my problem with this is that you've already interviewed Mr. Kelly at this time. Correct? Yes, this was after the interview. Okay. So the first part I have a problem was is that you said he was chasing undocumented foreign nationals, okay? He never said he was chasing them, okay? And you weren't there to see him chase. The detective and the defense attorney go back and forth a lot. Um, and you can tell he's getting frustrated with her line of questioning. Um, and I'll show you just uh, a quick clip. Why doesn't it matter 
where he shot, just that the fact that he shot. There's no way he could have shot over their heads and strike the victim the way he was struck, man. Exactly. That's why we're here. Shooting that way over the heads to my right, as illustrated in the courtroom on Friday, and shooting at a victim that you believe didn't move and went down right there. There is no way he did it by your words, correct? Ma'am, Friday you were asking me some very hypothetical questions that I don't even remember what you were asking me right now, ma'am, that day. But the shot, and I, Mr. Kelly, since the beginning was very untruthful. Very untruthful. That shot came from him. There's evidence. So all in all, I think it was a uh, good questioning on, on her behalf. So the deputy county attorney uh, begins his closing arguments by summarizing the case. He starts talking about how Gabriel and Daniel were approximately 115 yards away. They were beyond two fence lines. Um, he also talks about how it appeared that they were running away um, from uh, Mr. Kelly's property and how Mr. Kelly shot at them nine times. He also makes it a point uh, to talk about the different statements that Mr. Kelly provided as he told the story to different people. First, um, he talks about how Mr. Kelly says that he's being shot at. Uh, then there's another time where Mr. Kelly says that he's in a shootout, that there's men carrying rifles. Let me show you just a little bit of those clips here. During Detective Ayanza's interview, inconsistent. Every single time the story changed. Every single time the story changed. Shot at and I'm shooting back. Five individuals in this story. That's at 2.30 in the afternoon. Six minutes later, defendant changes that story. I had an altercation with someone. I heard a gunshot in his direction, in my direction. Inspected his horse while they spoke. Another point that the prosecutor makes uh, is when Mr. Kelly makes a comment about the animal. And that's something that he plays. plays the entire dispatch call. It's approximately eight minutes, so I'm not going to play the full clip. I will just play the portion about the animal. Uh, but that is something that he does uh, try to to use. And that's something that was constantly talked about. And that I only approach the body to make sure that the animal uh, is not a vegetable or a mineral. The animal wasn't alive and it was not alive. Okay. Uh, there were no signs. There was no sign of blood. Uh, there was just a uh, uh, an animal laying face down. An animal? An animal, and you know what an animal is. It's not a vegetable or a mineral. Okay. It's a body, and you know what I'm talking about. I understand what you're talking about, George. Um, okay, I'm going to send the deputy that... Oh. Uh, that's the comments about the animal, and the defense attorney will also touch on that, and she will try to explain what uh, Mr. Kelly was talking about and what he meant by that, and I'll play that clip for you as well, just so you kind of get both sides of it, um, but before I talk about the defense's closing argument, I do just want to point out uh, one other thing, because as you know, the case was for the second degree murder. The jurors also had the ability to convict him on lesser offenses like manslaughter or negligent homicide. However, there was also the charge for Daniel, which was the aggravated assault, and they did not convict him on that either, which I found kind of interesting as well. Um, so I want to just play a quick clip about uh, the aggravated assault portion that the prosecutor covers. Aggravated assault, second charge. Aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. The defendant committed an assault against Daniel. And the defendant used a deadly weapon in AK-47. Assault requires the defendant intentionally puts Daniel in a reasonable apprehension of imminent physical Injury. Steps outside of an AK 47 and shoot that gun. And that's the horse. 
Hunt the Daniel saved his life. He recognized that horse. He identified that horse. In order for the jury not to convict Mr. Kelly on the aggravated assault charge as well, uh, that means that the jury must not have found Daniel credible at all. Um, and I will place a link to my prior video where I kind of go over some of Daniel's testimony. So if you did not see it, um, at least you'll have some of the key points in his testimony. Brenda Larkin is a defense attorney who does the closing argument. She starts the case by telling the jurors that this is not a mystery that they have to solve, um, that this is not something that this is not something that the jurors should be guessing about, uh, that they that they should not try to answer any questions uh, by simply just trying to guess. Then she goes into talking about the burden of proof and what the state has to prove in order to get a conviction. She also talks about there being two sides to the story and she asked the jury to consider uh, the facts as it relates to the testimony provided um, by the witnesses. She talks about the calls made by Mr. Kelly and how it is possible uh, that he did uh, see men with rifles and he hears shots. And she talks about how he was justified in shooting. Who decides he's going to take matters completely into his own hands. He calls for help. He calls the guy who has the badge and the gun. He calls Jeremy Morcell. And he tells him, I hear a shot or something's shooting. I might have to return fire. Immediately, he tells law enforcement that he may have to fire. When he's walking outside, he has heard a shot. This is not a mystery shot, as the state describes. This is a real shot. Mr. Kelly hears it, and the whole situation completely changes in that moment. A gunshot outside of your home is not something you hear every day. Being confronted on his own property, in his own house, with criminal activity involving guns in his yard, and he doesn't know what's going to happen next. He knows he needs help, so he calls Border Patrol. Mr. Kelly, when he walks outside with his rifle, his intention is to stop this threat. His intention is to make these people go away. Because if you stay inside your house, you don't know what they are going to do. This was a split second decision. He sees a threat, he responds to the threat. Mr. Kelly is the man of his house. His wife is there. He needs to protect himself and he needs to protect his wife just like every man should do. And he is 100% justified in walking outside to meet this threat. When he walks outside, he sees people. He sees that they are carrying rifles. He walks out onto his porch. The metal door bangs behind him. It makes a noise. The person in front looks at him and points his rifle at him. Mr. Kelly tells this to Detective Einstein points his rifle at me. Under those circumstances, Mr. Kelly is 100% justified in firing his weapon at that person. He doesn't need to fire warning shots. He is justified in firing at that person in that moment. He goes on to talk about uh, the nine shots that were taken how Mr. Kelly shoots in the air, even though he didn't have to. After that, she goes on to talk about the fabricated confession. So let me play you a small clip of that. In spite of this, law enforcement essentially fabricates a confession. They write down on the booking form. That booking form is their statement of probable cause. Here's what happened. Subject, he was chasing people. He shot. He admitted he shot at multiple subjects. That was not true. Alan never said that. Law enforcement wasn't listening and they didn't care. They already decided that he was guilty and they were perfectly fine inventing words for him. 
words that were the opposite of what he said and putting those down as if he said them. He talks about how they never recovered a bullet and because they never recovered a bullet, uh, there was no way to actually know what gun uh, actually fired the fatal shot. She goes into talking about all the things that the state can't actually prove uh, based on the work that was done by the state. There's no bullet. So they can't prove which weapon this came from. They can't prove which type of weapon this came from. They can't prove, again, which type of ammunition this came from. The shell casings, we heard testimony about shell casings that are found on the patio. They can't prove which direction the shooter was pointing. There's, you make a circle around the shell casing. The shooter could be standing anywhere in that circle. They can't prove if the shooter was pointing straight or up or something else. Interestingly, the ballistics experts testified that had they known, had they been told that the there was a possibility this rifle was shot in an upward direction, they could have done testing on the shell casing pattern. And they might have been able to come to a conclusion about that. Yes, it was pointing up or no, or it's inconclusive. But they didn't do the test because they were never asked to by the state. The investigators in this case never tested their own theory. They never considered that what Alan said might actually be supported by some evidence. And maybe we should look for that evidence too, not just evidence that shows that he's guilty. They didn't do that. And now we'll never know. I want to point out uh, her comments regarding Daniel and the aggravated assault, uh, which might have been what helped the jury decide not to convict Alan on that charge. It's not the house that's either two football fields away from the wall or 15 meters away from the wall. That is not a description that anybody could offer of this area who has been there. The only conclusion that can be reached based on Daniel's description of this property is that he wasn't there. And that's just the property. He describes other things too. <laughs> He describes being 10 meters away from the house when this happens. There is no body that is 10 meters away from the house. That is not possible. He describes the house being on his left. I'm facing south. That puts him to the west. The body is located to the east. Again, not possible. Daniel describes the shots coming from away from the house, towards the house, towards him and Gabriel. Not possible. You cannot find Mr. Kelly guilty of aggravated assault against Daniel because Daniel was not there. As far as all the other charges, the charges that relate to Gabriel, uh, she does go on to say that they can't convict him on those because the state never proved that Mr. Kelly actually shot Gabriel. Um, so there you have it. That's kind of a summary of the last couple days of the trial. On Monday, April 29th, the court scheduled a status conference. It's scheduled for 1.30 p.m., and that's Arizona time. The court has scheduled that so the county attorneys can let the judge know and the defense attorneys know how they intend to proceed, whether they are going to refile the case. If the state decides to refile the case, I will make sure to post an update and let you know. As always, thank you for watching. Make sure you leave any comments that you may have below and don't forget to subscribe and share the video. Until next time.